Tonight, President Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, has come out swinging, questioning the credibility of former Trump lawyer and fixer, the wolf, Michael Cohen, calling him a liar and a scoundrel. The Trump camp has been in full attack mode since one of Cohen's secretly recorded conversations with the president, while he was still a candidate, was released to CNN last week. Giuliani has been making waves with a series of television appearances over the past couple days. We're going to have full coverage and reaction from the one and only Judge Jeanine Pirro and former assistant U.S. attorney Andy McCarthy. But first up, let's go to FBN's Edward Lawrence for a full recap. Edward. Well, Kennedy, uh, first I can tell you the sources are saying that the president's current legal team, his personal legal lawyers, are leaning towards not allowing him to talk one-on-one -on -one with special counsel Robert Mueller. Now, no final decision has been made, but sources are telling Fox News that they're leaning or almost certainly leaning uh, to a no on the interview. Now, Mueller has charged several individuals with lying to his investigators, uh, and there's concern, legal experts say, that his legal team, the president's legal team, may be worried there'll be word game traps the president could fall into with the special counsel. Now, still the talks are ongoing about possible parameters for an interview with the president. Now, this, as Giuliani is talking about, the recordings that President Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, made of their conversations. 183 recordings that we have. There are innumerable other recordings of other people having nothing to do with the Trump with Trump, the Trump organization, which will give you an idea of what a, what a, what a scoundrel he was. I mean, I, I never knew this about him. I, 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 up until a month ago, two months ago, I'd have said pretty nice things about him. And Giuliani said that uh, hearing that a personal attorney would be recording conversations of a client without that client's knowledge changed his opinion of him. Giuliani says the couple of the tapes uh, seemed to doctored. He said that they cut off abruptly in certain areas where they should have kept going. Now, finally, Giuliani says that he's or he's talking about a possible payment uh, that was made. And it's been discussed on one of those recordings with a former Playboy model. And regarding that payment, that specific payment, he says that collusion is not a crime. Kennedy? Edward, thank you so much. Now, Michael Cohen certainly has recordings of the president, at least one recording, but are they legitimate? According to Giuliani, the answer is no. There's no doubt that one of them is cut off. If you take the one that was played here num numerous times last week, it goes, some it goes something like this. Um, there's got to be financing. The president's very surprised, which indicates he didn't know about this transaction. It's financing. What, what, what do you mean financing? Cohen says, well, we've we got to pay. And he said, not by cash. Interruption. Cohen says, no, 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 but... And then Trump says, check. Immediately, it's cut off. Click. Hmm. Next thing you hear is Don Jr. He must be talking to Don Jr., but that's erased also. So, so yeah, he erased him. Hmm. Cohen maintains the tapes are, in fact, authentic, but who do you believe? Because it's not like a lawyer who secretly recorded his client who, who would lie to anyone. Well, let me ask host of Justice with Judge Janine that is on the Fox News Channel. She's the author of the brand new best-selling book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy. Judge Janine Pirro. Hello, Kennedy. Oh, so glorious lady. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this a little bit. What okay. stands out most to you in this whole Cohen fiasco? The fact that he recorded the tapes, or recorded the, the conversations, rather, the fact that he seems to have edited them, or that they have been leaked in the middle of an ongoing investigation? Well, we could spend 10 minutes on each one of those uh, uh, possible possibilities you mentioned. Number one, as a judge, I would very often rule on the authenticity of a tape and whether or not the one sided laid a proper foundation for the admissibility of such a tape. Are they admissible and then, thus far? Well, no. You would have to have a forensic uh, analyst look at them to make sure they hadn't been tampered with. You'd have to have some kind of um, a recommend or someone saying that this is the original tape. It hasn't been tampered. It hasn't been cut off. Is it a tape of a tape? Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that you bring in forensic experts for. And by the way, Rudy Giuliani came on my show Saturday night in breaking news the first time he had mentioned it. And given that I understand that this kind of thing is only admissible if they lay a proper foundation, which means you'd have to have the original of this tape or else you better explain why there is an automatic cutoff at the point where it is beneficial to the president. But I think even more important is that the fact that you've got this guy who is tape recording a client. In some states, you can be, forget about, you know, whether or not that's ethical. You can actually be disbarred for doing that. In New York, as a one-party state, he had the right to tape it, but as a lawyer, he did not. Okay, but what about attorney-client privilege? Because right. we hear about that in terms of the Cohen raids on his home and the hotel room and his office, uh, where, you know, he was sort of 
po poised as the victim. Mm -hmm. But now, what about attorney-client privilege in regards to those tapes that the FBI may have seized? Well, here's the problem. They had a master. They call him a master. It's uh, as Judge Kimba Wood appointed Judge uh, Barbara Jones uh, to look at the tapes to decide whether anything should be seen or which of them should be seen the, by the prosecutor. She made that decision. And here's the thing. We now have this tape that's been leaked to CNN. What does that tell you? That tells me it's not about the admissibility of the tape in a court of law. Right. It's about the idea of impeaching the president, getting anything out there negative. And Maggie Haberman, I believe, in the New York Times said, you know, Rudy didn't uh, leak it and the president didn't leak it. So L Laney, uh, uh, Lanny, Lanny Davis. Davis did it or Michael Cohen okay, did so it. Okay, so let me ask you this. Today, uh, former Mayor Giuliani said that there is one two-hour tape that exists. It's a conversation that was supposed to be off the record between Chris Cuomo and oh. Michael Cohen. I mean, can you imagine that? You actually say to someone from the press, here's my phone, I'm not going to tape record this, I'm going to put it in my drawer, and he lies to him and he tape records it. I'd like to know all those tapes that are in there, how many people he taped, and you want to know why Rudy Giuliani changed his opinion from, yeah, he's a decent guy, you know, he's not the best lawyer, but he's a decent guy, to, you know, this guy's a pathological liar. He tells Chris Cuomo, I'm not taping it, and then he tapes it. He never told Donald Trump, he was taping conversations. Plus, he was under, they were, feds were looking at him for a long time. Why did he keep this stuff? Is it his ace in the hole? And as I said in my open on Saturday, and excuse my voice, this is a guy who confessed to sinking the Titanic to get out of the crosshairs of the federal prosecutors. Well, Ed, but he hasn't been charged with anything, but it, it certainly oh, but has not been difficult for him to go back on his loyalty. Loyalty is obviously very important to the president. And here's a, a person that he's worked with for many, many years, and he thought this was his most loyal and, and trusted. Well, look, I mean, whenever somebody is in the crosshairs of a federal prosecutor, remember, I've been a prosecutor, judge, and DA for over three decades. I get this business. I work with the feds all the time. You're in their crosshairs. You're going to say anything because the fact that Michael Cohen hasn't been charged with anything is not the point. The point is the feds say to him, we've got all these files. We know what you did. Now you give us something. And you give us something, we won't charge you, or we'll charge you far, far less. But the only way to squeeze them right now is not to charge them with anything. Say, we've got all this on you. You've got kids. You don't want to go to prison for the rest of your life. Now, it's a game. It's interesting because the president once famously said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and my supporters wouldn't turn on me. It wouldn't make a difference. And, you know, you see the Michael Avenatti's and Michael Cohen's of the world really put this stuff into the public sphere to try and damage the president. Mm -hmm. Uh, yet somehow, even with a lot of members of the mainstream media sort of lined up against him editorially, and, you know, this continued ongoing saga of investigations and personal turmoil, uh, the president really has not been impacted as far as approval ratings. Well, not only approval ratings, but, you know, there isn't one metric that is, uh, that, that is worse off under this president. Every metric is better off. You know business. You're on the business channel. You know we've got more jobs than people to fill them. The president is more popular than he was before he met with well, Putin. Well, certainly with, with the people who are most loyal to him. No, that with, with the electorate has not wavered at all. The people who hate him, they continue, oh, they're going to, continue to, hate to hate him. him. Yes. It's like that song, you know. So what about what hate. about those in the middle? How are they affected? Independent voters, suburban women, voters like that, that the president critically needs were not uh, members of either one of those factions. I, I think that for the independent or the person in the middle who can be swayed, they say to themselves, you know what, enough with the hookers and the porn stars. Whatever happened, happened before he was president. He wasn't in the Oval Office with an intern of all people. You know, let's move on. I want to take care of my family. I want to keep my family safe. I think they're going to see in Donald Trump, as I talk about in my book, Liars and Leakers, a guy who's at the tip of the spear and is willing I'm to so take everything. I'm so glad you brought up your book because oh. I want I ask her all about that. Uh, just over an hour ago, the president tweeted about her book saying, Congratulations to Judge Janine on the tremendous success of her new number one best selling book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals The Case Against the Anti Trump Conspiracy. Uh, so that's pretty high praise because it seems as though the president's book club is, is quite successful and the people he tweets about tend to sell. 
quite a few copies. Well, here, here's the thing. You know, uh, I was number one on the New York Times bestsellers list, number one on the Washington Post, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And I'm very grateful for that. The book is a reflection of what I have seen in the last election and everything in the year and a half since then. I know a con when I see it. This Russia collusion investigation was a frame-up of this president so that he would be distracted. But people don't know Donald Trump. I've known him for 30 years. The man is a force of nature. Yep. He can go into a den of lions and come out with a suit and tie straight and Speaking a lion's head. Speaking of den of lions, would you, if you could do it over again, would you have gone on The View? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should, should people from Fox go on that trip? That's their call. You know what? For me, it was an absolute. I'd been on it before. But what happened to me on The View is a microcosm of what's happening in this nation. And that is the left thinks they have the right to shut down the right. And the people on the right don't have a right to speak, whether it's at a university or whether it's a television show or anywhere else. It's time for people to recognize the fascists are the people who are not letting other people did you, talk. Did you use some bad words? What I did was I walked off that said and I said Whoopi you know that I have Did been I have word? been a fighting for Americans and victims my whole life I took off my mic and I was I was very angry I got thrown off a set and then got thrown out of a out of a building Did you at go ABC. back if they invited you back I'd have to think about it. I really would. I mean, I'm not there to be thrown out. The yeah. people that I was with were very, very disturbed. And I said, come on, guys, let's just go. Um, it's not the way people treat people. And if it had been the reverse, I think the consequence would have been different. Judge Janine, thank you so much. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, Kennedy. Right. Good to very be with good. you. End of summer read. <laughs> as, or, as Edward Lawrence reported earlier, Rudy Giuliani doesn't want the president to speak to special counsel Robert Mueller this afternoon. He called in to outnumbered. I was on the couch. I took the call along with my co-host and Guy Benson. Here's Giuliani. Are you now yes or no on a sit down between the president and Robert Mueller? Well, two, two things. First, I'm no on a sit down until until we get uh, we get ironed out exactly what they want to do. Uh, and then the process is we have five uh, co-counsel, senior people. We'll advise the president. He decides. Mm -hmm. And he's always leaned in favor of doing it. Well, what so are you telling that. him about that? What, what, what well, advice well, are... Right now, I'm telling him no way. So will the president ever sit down for a one-on-one -on -one with Robert Mueller? Let me ask former assistant U.S. attorney and Fox News contributor Andy McCarthy is back. Welcome back, Andy. Nice to be here. So there are two sides to this, and uh, I asked the former mayor a little bit about that today on Outnumber. There's the, the legal side, obviously, and the president's legal team has counseled him to not sit down with special counsel. Uh, but uh, the political side, there are Americans are growing more dubious of the investigation, but they still want to hear what the president has to say because he's so adamant about his innocence. So what should he do? Well, I, I don't think politically it's going to hurt him that much to say no. My And maybe I'm leaning on it this way because I'm a lawyer, but I, the way I look at it, there's no downside for him to say no and there's lots of peril potentially to say yes and really he should not be put to this choice Kennedy because the the Justice Department should step in here and make sure that before Mueller even asks for this and I, I, I guess we're past that point mm -hmm. um, he ought to be made to show that number one he's got a serious crime that the president is implicated in and that the president has information that he can't get from any other source. And you say that those are the two critical conditions that special counsel should meet. That's the threshold before the president's lawyers agree to allow him to sit down with Robert Mueller and his team. Yeah, I, I would say so. In fact, you know, if, he, if they actually had a serious crime, then you'd have Fifth Amendment privilege concerns and all that stuff. I don't, I don't think that's going on. But, you know, to put, to put it in a different context, imagine the president was a journalist mm -hmm. i think everybody would understand at that point that if a prosecutor tried to subpoena a journalist at a minimum you would have to show that there was a really serious crime and that the journalist was the only repository or source of the information that the prosecutor needed to make the case and it's hard to understand for me at least why people can see that so clearly with a journalist but not with the president of the united states who's responsibilities are obviously a lot more important. Now, we, we haven't heard a lot from special counsel. Uh, the American public doesn't really know what the parameters are of the investigation. It's been difficult to get some of that information from the Department of Justice. Do you get the sense that uh, this investigator is still looking for a crime? 
Well, I think he's, as long as the investigation is continuing, they're continuing to look for a crime. But we always have to remember two things with Mueller. First of all, the fact that you're not hearing anything other than when he returns charges is a good thing. That's being responsible. That's the way he's supposed to conduct himself. Um, and, and secondly, what I would say is that um, with respect to the charges that have been filed, there's no indication that the original rationale for the investigation, which is collusion with Russia in which Americans connected to the Trump campaign conspire, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like that's going to materialize. But Mueller was given a counterintelligence investigation to get to the bottom of what Russia did. So as the investigation continues, he's, he's actually pursuing multiple angles. One is, are there criminal cases against these people? That may end up being a dry hole, except for what he's already indicted. But he does have this mandate to get to the bottom of Russia's meddling in the election. All right. Andy McCarthy, thank you so much. My favorite brat packer always. My pleasure. Very good. Coming up, President Trump doubling down on his threat to shut down the government if he doesn't get the funding for that border wall. But he's already getting pushback from Republicans. How likely is the president to get his wish? I will ask Sebastian Gorka. He's next. During his joint press conference with the new Italian Prime Minister at the White House today, President Trump doubled down on a tweet he sent out yesterday about getting funding for the border wall. If we don't get border security, after many, many years of talk within the United States, I would have no problem doing a shutdown. Lawmakers have until September 30th to pass a new spending bill. Yay. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said he's confident they can avoid a shutdown. So is the president playing politics, as some of his critics claim? Or is he really willing to shut down the whole damn thing in his quest for the border wall? Joining me to discuss former deputy assistant to President Trump and Fox News national security strategist Dr. Sebastian Gorka in the House. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, Why We Fight, Recovering America's Will to Win. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Gorka. It is delightful to join you on your show, I do believe, for the first time, Gennady. Thank you for I having know. me. Uh, it's your maiden voyage. Well done. Um, so let's talk a little bit about shutting the government down, because I've always thought that there's too much government. And uh, maybe a government <laughs> shutdown is good because people will realize how superfluous most of it is. However, with the midterms looming and a government shutdown sometime in September, is that uh, politically negligent strategy for the president. I tend to agree with you, Kennedy. I, I live and work in the swamp, and I can tell you, it's delightful when the government shuts down. Uh, there is too much government. Whenever it does shut down, uh, everything seems to function anyway, but there's no traffic in D.C. No, so, you know, I, I, I say bring it. Uh, this is the president. This is Donald Trump being Donald Trump. Um, don't test the man, but he's prepared to test Congress because, you know, it's clear from the reaction by the GOP, they're just not serious. The wall and immigration reform was the first significant policy platform of his candidacy as, 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 as president. And he's serious about it. And he said there's no red lines in terms of negotiating today at that press conference with the, the uh, Italian head of state. But there is one red line. And that's the wall. The president will never back down on the wall. And he will get it sooner or later. The question is whether it's sooner or whether it's later. All right. So how do Democrats factor into this? And obviously, they want a deal for the Dreamers. A lot of Democrats have said right. they would be willing to offer funding for the border wall if, in fact, there was some sort of um, immigration fix for Dreamers spe specifically. But both sides need to figure out what we're doing with immigration policy in this country. So where do Democrats give? Well, they're, they're liars. I mean, look at what happened last time. The president already offered a darker times two. Instead of the 800,000, he actually had a guarantee for 1.6 million people's uh, situation to be normalized. And the Democrats said, no thanks. Uh, they don't care about these issues. They don't want to solve these issues. They've, they've been taken over by the radicals. Look at this woman, Ocasio-Cortez, in New York. Mm -hmm. They don't act in good faith. Uh, and as such, it's very difficult to work with them. So, 
Now, the, the question is, what is the GOP going to do? We have to resolve these issues. I'm an immigrant. I am a legal immigrant to the United States. It took me three years and quite a bit of money to become an American citizen, and I am a proud American citizen now. I don't see why you get to jump to the head of the queue just because you came here illegally or your parents brought you here illegally. So my answer is people who came here illegally never get citizenship. You, get, you go to the back of the queue. You can apply for a green card. Mm -hmm. but you go to the back of the queue, Kennedy. Yeah, I, and I, I know that amnesty is a big sticking point, but now I want to switch to Iran. Uh, the president also made news today saying that, that he would yes. meet with President Rouhani in a no-holds-barred steel cage match. Is that a good idea? It, it seems like that was one of the criticisms that was leveled at candidate Obama before he became president, that he was willing to sit down with uh, nefarious and shady leaders. Is this a good idea for this president? No. The, the issue with Obama was the fact that he went on an apology tour as soon as he became president, got a Nobel Peace Prize He's for doing nothing. He's still on nothing, it, by the way. Yeah, he is, unfortunately. And then, and then he gives $140 billion to the Iranians. Sitting down with Rouhani is very different from giving them $140 billion where, by which they don't actually change their behavior. Look, I work for Donald Trump. Uh, he'll sit down and talk to anybody if, if it is potentially good for Americans and for national security and for the international system. So, you know, he's, he's not... He doesn't shut the door to anybody. Look at what he did with, you know, Little Rocket Man mm -hmm. ends up actually meeting him in Singapore and they sign that joint statement. So he is the arch negotiator. He wrote the, you know, the book, The Art of the Deal. So, you know, he'll sit down, but only if it's good for America. All right, so let me ask you, who is the worst person on earth? <laughs> who is the worst person on earth? Yes. Uh, right, right now, in terms of uh, mass murder, I would probably say Assad of Syria. Should the president sit down with him? If the goal is to stop the slaughter of more than 400,000 people, mm -hmm. women and children, uh, yeah, I mean, look, we had Kennedy sit down with Khrushchev in Vienna in 1962. Mm -hmm. We had uh, American presidents sit down with Stalin, who exterminated 8 million Ukrainians. So in the interests of the greater good, such as defeating Hitler, you probably can sit down with people who otherwise, you, you know, hold your nose at. I thought you were going to say Hillary Clinton. She's going to be locked no, 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 there are some red lines. <laughs> there are some red Sebastian lines. Gorka, thank you very much. Thanks, Kennedy. Very good. All right, coming up, $32 trillion. That's trillion with a tip. That's how much Bernie Sanders wants to steal from you for his Medicare for All plan. I'll explain why he and his socialist cronies need math lessons. The monologue is next. There is no doubt Senator Bernie Sanders is well-intentioned when he talks about the urgency in passing his Medicare for All bill, but the commie red blood that pulses through his good heart betrays this impossible plan that is nothing more than an expensive statist pipe dream. It's more like a pipe bomb that would blow up the economy with long-term irreversible damage. As we well know, you can't unring the bell of entitlement. The freedom-focused Mercatus Center did something Senator Sanders' office has not. They actually ran a cost-benefit analysis and found this sicko socialism would cost roughly $32.6 trillion over 10 years. Even if you doubled tax collections from individuals and corporations, yes, that means you'd be paying twice what you already do in taxes, that still doesn't cover the tab. My God, free health care is expensive. Sanders derided the findings as illegitimate and, quote, grossly misleading and biased because the Koch brothers have supported Mercatus in the past. So let's compare that study with the same analysis from a different, more left-leaning, Sanders-esque outfit, the Urban Institute. They came up with a vastly different projection, estimating the plan would only cost $32 trillion over 10 years. Oh, you mean it's the exact same malignant tumor no matter how you dissect it? Gee, it's odd how math works. Senator Sanders should pull his head out of his own dark utopian cavern and fiddle with an abacus once in a while. We know single-payer doesn't work, 
by turning to our sad veterans whose monolithic care was so cruelly rationed and withheld, many wilted and died waiting for treatment. And this was to a group of people who served, many of whom fought for freedom, yet the government punched them in the sack while they waited in vain. Imagine how poorly the truly marginalized will be treated, to whom the country owes no debt, yet generations will slowly go in debt as grandma, innovation, and a once succulent talent pool are all left to die on the side of the road to single payer so Bernie Sanders can indulge his Scandinavia fetish. No thank you. That's the memo. About a third of Senate Democrats support Bernie's Medicare for All bill, and about two-thirds of House Democrats support a similar bill in the lower chamber. So is the left serious about this $30 trillion fantasy? With me now, Washington Examiner commentary editor Tim Carney is back on the program. Welcome back, Tim. Thank you, Kennedy. So uh, tell me, how does this math work? How do you support a plan that requires by moderate and conservative estimates, 32 trillion over 10 years. Well, let me re re first reemphasize that point. This is a conservative estimate. What Mercatus Institute did to be sort of generous to Bernie was to say, let's go along with your guesses that this will in fact create efficiencies, drive down the costs of prescription drugs, drive down uh, the, the costs of some, uh, of some usage by healthcare, and drive down some administrative costs. They assume that to get to their 32. Now, that's assuming a government program can actually do something more efficient than the market. Now, I'm not a defender of the insurance companies, but I also don't think that that's necessarily a given. But yes, the other point to remember is that this isn't just about sort of socializing health care. You, you check on the, the website of the Democratic Socialists of America where you're getting Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, these other uh, Democratic candidates, and they say the reason to debate this is to heighten class conflicts. The reason to debate this is to question the very idea of capitalism. And I'd go further. I'd say the reason to push something like socialized health care is to stick the government into the deepest recesses of everybody's life the deepest, most vulnerable, and most sensitive aspect of people's lives. Uh, you know, we raise concerns about civil liberty violations in terms of FISA. Imagine how the government could violate you if they were control, in control of every aspect of your health care. And just and think about the politics of that. Every donut you eat, Kennedy, I, the taxpayer, am paying for it. That gives me a right to say, no, no more donuts. We're cutting you off. Two donuts, that's enough. That's where you get these things from. And if you remember the tobacco lawsuit from last decade, two decades ago, it was based, it was states suing the cigarette companies yeah. based on the expenditures through Medicaid. Once everything is covered by the taxpayer, then the government has the right to control all aspects of you. What you eat, how many kids you have, all of that will be the uh, the legitimate interests of the government. Yeah, and and just look at Canada and how long it takes uh, to get treatment. It, it can be 14 weeks in some cases that uh, those who need treatment from a specialist have to wait in order for that government health care to kick in for them. Americans don't want to wait. They want choice, and sometimes if you want choice, uh, you're going to pay a little bit more for it. And innovation is a critical component of the healthcare system in this country. Uh, when it is socialized, it will stifle innovation, and that means people will not live as long, and we won't find the treatments that others desperately need. And the rest of the world is, to some extent, free riding on the fact that we're doing innovation. When American companies come up with the drugs, or Switzerland, or, you know, there's a couple countries that are doing the innovation, the other countries get to benefit from it. If you cramp down on that innovation here in the U.S., then you don't have anybody we can free ride on. All right. Thank you for allowing me to ride your coattails, <laughs> Tim Carney. Great to see you. Thank you. President Trump has intensified his feud with the media this weekend, tweeting Sunday... Quote, had a very good and interesting meeting with the, at the White House with A.G. Sulzberger, publisher of the New York Times. Spent much time talking about the vast amounts of fake news being put out by the media and how that fake news has morphed into phrase, enemy of the people, sad. The publisher of the Times responded by saying that Trump's attacks on journalism are dangerous and harmful to our country. The president then shot back with another tweet storm, railing against, quote, the failing New York Times and the Amazon Washington Post. What are the president's attacks on the media actually dangerous? The panel is here to discuss from Fox News headlines. 24-7 reporter Carly Shimkus is here. 
along with campus reform editor-in-chief Lawrence Jones and America Rising PAC executive director Alex Smith is back on the show. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Um, so I'll, I'll talk with you about this. Obviously, the right of a free press is enshrined in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Uh, the president knows that his base is distrustful of media organizations that, that seem to relentlessly attack the president. But there has to be a separation here, and there has to be some value in allowing a, a free press to challenge this in every administration. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you do support the press. You've got to support the press. It's their job to do this. Um, I don't think you should bar uh, journalists from the White House. I didn't like it when they did it to Fox News, uh, when they do it to conservative outlets. But I do think that the press has gotten herself in a little pickle because they've become activists. And so they can't get upset when the president attacks back uh, at them when they throw flame bombs at the president. Remember, this is the same press that used this president during the primary, uh, the Republican primary, for their ratings. They loved them yeah. then. He gave them so much access. They loved them. And then when the when that shifted in the general election, they became activists. Yeah, and again. the tone shifted. And, and I remember that. I remember talking about that with various people uh, who were saying, just wait and see what happens because mm -hmm. they are going to shift. They love him now because yep. they think he's beatable. Exactly. Once he's the nominee, it's going to be very different. And it seems like there is a concerted effort. So how do we still maintain a free press and push back on some of the editorial na narratives that seem to be just personal axes they're grinding? Mm. Well, I think that this whole, this whole conversation about is what the president doing dangerous, I think that that... That is a really, that's a bit of a stretch because he's not calling for violence against the press. He's just simply calling out what he sees as biased media coverage. At the same time, I do think that the president, although he is a very off the cuff guy, he should watch his words in a way when he tweets because his words do hold a lot of weight. And all it takes is some crazy person to do something horrible and then we're having an entirely different conversation so Kennedy that line that you just mentioned it, it's a fine one and I think we're all trying to walk it in a very new way that we never have before all right Alexander what do we do I mean, I think it's all about transparency. A great example of this is recently America Rising through Freedom of Information uh, laws. We requested the records um, from where uh, the Chevy Chase County Executive, um, where Brett Kavanaugh's wife worked, mm -hmm. and we said, what were the New York Times and the AP asking about? They were asking about specific terms related to her, abortion, guns. What, do you, what kind of stories do you think that they were looking to write mm -hmm. about Judge Kavanaugh or about his wife? Um, and so, you know, through social media, through transparency, I think we're able to spread that narrative and that counterbalance much more efficiently. All right. Very good. Well, and, and everyone should be able to voice their opinion. But we have to realize sometimes there's a difference between journalism and reporting objective facts yeah. and opinion and, and, and those activism. things. Yes. And a lot of these journalists have become activists. And I think that's the frustration of the president. Well, I am frustrated. I need more panel and more cowbell. <laughs> I've definitely got more panel after the break. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh has won over one Republican senator who's on the fence about supporting him, but he's only met with just one Democrat in the Senate so far. Will the Dems block Kavanaugh's confirmation, and will that end up hurting them politically? That's him. Welcome back. Senate Majority Leader, Minority Leader, rather, Chuck Schumer has been urging red state Democrats to oppose Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination, but it could be time for him to quit while he's behind. Kavanaugh met with West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin today, and while it was his first the first meeting with the Democrat, it will not be his last. Indiana Senator Joe Donnelly announced that he, too, will meet with the nominee August 15th. Kavanaugh is a good bet to get approved and confirmed and at this point, opposing him could cost red state Democrats dearly at the polls in November. So is Chuck Schumer running a fool's errand or is he running a fool's errand? <laughs> My panel is back. <laughs> Carly Shemkis, Lawrence Jones and Alex Smith. Um, Alex, I will start with you because this is a very curious position. There are three Democrats who voted to confirm Neil Gorsuch, and that wasn't even right before the midterms. But now you have senators in places like North Dakota, Indiana, and West Virginia, where Brett Kavanaugh is a very popular choice. you got people like Cory Booker and Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer 
trying to get them to shut down the nomination, but that could cost them their political careers. Well, and I feel like reading the tea leaves in this whole confirmation process is akin to analyzing the politics of like a middle school schoolyard because, you know, at least saw that, uh, you know, Joe Manchin met with Kavanaugh today. He, he bragged about how it was supposed to be a half hour meeting, but it turned into a two hour meeting. So it seems like it was a really productive meeting. But he said that while he was on the way to Chuck Schumer's office. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what's going to go on there? Is Chuck Schumer going to be able to hold the line? As you mentioned, the, the Democrats really, at this point in the cycle, could afford to lose more than just the three that they did yeah. on Justice Gorsuch nomination. Because someone like Claire McCaskill, someone like Bill Nelson in Florida, yep. they, they're going back to their constituents empty-handed uh, at this point. They are, you know... In terms of opposing the president on health care, on tax reform, on Gorsuch, they're going to go back to their constituents again and say, we're standing against the president. The constituents are going to say, what are we sending to Washington yeah, for? Yeah, no, you've also got people like John Tester and others. And, and Manchin has even said, hey, Chuck, don't tell me what to do here, man. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I have to make up my mind. I have to talk to this guy. We have to suss out some of the issues and his positions and his opinions that he's written about. It seems at this point that, that Kavanaugh is going to be confirmed. Yeah, he's going to be confirmed. And then, like I, I've always said uh, from the very beginning, there's a lot of stuff that I don't agree with him. The Fourth Amendment is one. He seems a little soft. I agree he doesn't respect completely. on it. But, you know, this is where we are. And he are. deserves pushback. He, he deserves pushback. But at the end of the day, Manchin is worried about his political career. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's going to vote for him because it, it's suicide. A lot of people that hold, held their nose to vote for Donald Trump voted for him because of the Supreme Court. Yes, that's if right. You want to uh, get them rallied up, block this nomination. You know, yeah, it's almost suicide, though, in both ways. I feel like if ever you could make a case for holding a pity party for politicians, it's for these red state Democrats that are in an absolutely impossible situation. And when you are in that no-win political si situation, I think that these people should really take politics out of it, which is what I think Manchin did in, in this meeting today. He's trying to do that. Yeah, and he's just saying, listen, he's going at it and saying, I'm going to base my decision on if... Kavanaugh is qualified. And he also had a round table back in his home state and he released a statement saying I asked him questions that you posed to me. He has an, an email where people can send him questions for Kavanaugh. Yeah. So, and I and I do think that uh, going back to the Fourth Amendment thing, what what Rand Paul said, what I thought was really smart. He said he's basing his nomination on the totality of their views and character opinions yeah, rather than so just one. Rand thing. is a yes. I think other Republicans will follow. We'll we'll have to see. see. Thank yeah. you so much, Alex and uh, Lawrence and Carly. Great to see you all. Good to see you. Topical storm is next. It's so topical and stormy. <laughs> Breaking news, Stormy Daniels has signed on to participate in the British edition of Big Brother. Big Brava. It's a chance for fans to see her as they've never seen her before, with clothes on. That's a true story. And this is the Topical Storm. Topic number one. We begin tonight on the New York City subway, where passengers are wrestling with a fair hike. In any other city, a wrestling match on the train would be the most bizarre sight of the year, but in New York... These two were easily the most normal guys on board. If anything, they stood out because they weren't soliciting gas money for their spaceship. But everybody forgot about that a second later when a naked hobbit came through screaming about feminism. Oh, it was nice to see Lena Dunham again. Hi, sister. Topic number two. Canadians are some of the nicest people in the world, which makes it all the more shocking that a Canadian golfer was behaving like a real animal this weekend. Oh, come on, man. I know you love mullets and all, but that's a lot of hair. There was a time when golf fans expected to see a tiger on the greens, but these days you're more likely to find a tiger on a Perkins waitress. It's the only time he finishes first anymore. <laughs> but back to the bear who caused such a ruckus that he nearly woke up half the people watching the Golf Channel. Over 10,000 people have watched the video, which works out to one for every piece they found the cameraman in. I'm kidding. They ripped him in half, and that was that. Like a draft card. Topic number three. Marquette University has a new bus program, and so far the drivers are having a blast. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, sweet Lord. Oh, slow down. Uh, the man told police he was slowing down when he accidentally stepped on the gas and slammed into the school library. Luckily, everyone was fine, but the driver is still in hot water because this is not what the dean meant when he told students to hit the books. 
please forgive the pun, and while you're at it, give the driver a round of applause because he recently lost 20 pounds. Apparently, he went on a crash diet. Ra -da 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 -da. Topic number four. The video I'm about to show you contains dozens of people jumping off a bridge. And incredibly, not one of them is a Mets fan. Look at this. Ah! It's the annual diving contest in the Bosnian city of Mostar. The competition is 452 years old, making it the same combined age as the top three Democratic presidential candidates for 2020. Yeah! At this rate, the next Democratic convention is going to be a half-price matinee. The only problem is, every time the audience claps, the lights will go out. What happened? I got a little off track there, but I should point out that it was nice to see someone taking a dive besides Hillary on a set of stairs. Why are you wearing a smock and an overcoat in July? <laughs> Topic number five. Nothing to hide here. Finally, it is Mugshot Monday. And this week's winner is Wade for it from Florida. And now I know that part is not surprising, but the excuse you're about to hear is pretty bonkers. Even if the land of misfit toys we call the Sunshine State has any say, Earl Stevens Jr., there he is, he looks like Hannibal Lecter, was pulled over with an open bottle of liquor in his car, but he told the cops he shouldn't be arrested for drunk driving because he only drank at the stop signs. <laughs> The good news is police applauded his honesty. The bad news is he's going to be on the next season of Orange is the New Johnny Walker Black. Stevens was arrested at the scene, and he has since lost his license. Luckily, he can still take the train. Oh, that's got to hurt right in the baby maker. This is not assault, Your Honor. He only hit him when the train was stopped. Mm. Hey, guess what? We'll be right back. Thank you. Is this thing on? Hello. <laughs> a lot of people don't know I'm a professional beatboxer. Thank you for watching the best hour of your day. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kennedy Nation on Facebook. It's Kennedy FBN. Email Kennedy FBN at foxbusiness.com. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern, our special time. Please be there with Lee Zeldin, Camille Foster, and Chris Starwolf. And you, boo. Night. <laughs>